Hello, I'm Michelle Hewley, and this is Fire on the Landscape, a podcast production of Earth Common Journal. is warming and our climate has changed. The impacts of human activity are being felt in a variety of more extreme and more frequent natural disasters, from floods to hurricanes and to wildfires. Wildfires across our world are increasing in intensity and severity. So we can't eliminate it. It's part of the natural system. So we have to learn to live with fire and smoke. Atmospheric conditions have created a longer wildfire season, the period of time in which weather, fuels, and human activity combine to produce the most opportunistic environment for a wildfire to start. Historically, we've looked at fire as an element we need to fully suppress. But as our climate continues to change, scientists and fire management agencies are urging that we need to adapt that exclusionary practice to consider the natural role of wildfire in our environments. We're going to get more fire. It's going to be more intense, bigger, hotter, faster. So we have to start to change how we're doing things. As well as the increasing costs associated with full suppression and the human impact on rapidly changing ecosystems. I'm here today with two gentlemen who have made it their life's work to study and consider how wildfire management can be adapted. Cordy Timstra was, until recently, the wildfire science coordinator for the wildfire management branch in Alberta. He now works as a wildfire science and management consultant. But first, we're going to be talking to the fire guy, Mike Flanagan. Currently, the Research Chair for Predictive Services, Emergency Management, and Fire Services at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, British Columbia. Mike also is the Canada Wildfire Science Director and a faculty advisor supporting a number of postgraduate students. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us here today, Mike. Thanks, Michelle. So, Mike, historically, we have looked at fire as an element that we need to fully suppress. But as our climate changes, scientists and fire management agencies are urging that we need to adapt that exclusionary practice and that we need to consider the natural role of wildfire in our environment, as well as the increasing costs associated with full suppression. So I guess I'm just wondering, how does that fit in with some of the science and research that you've been conducting? So it's important to understand the natural role wildfire plays in many of our forests in Canada. Our forests have survived and even thrived in a regime of semi-regular stand replacing, stand renewing fires. The tree species are used to this and they have strategies to deal with it. Um, Some have thick barks, when you think of the red pines and white pines more in eastern Canada, but there's also serotonous cones that uh, pines, lodgepole, jack pine, have as well as black spruce as semi-serotonous cones. That means there's a waxy resin that seals the cones and the heat from the fire releases that waxy resin so that seeds can release. So you see a stand of jack pine, a fire goes through, kills the parent tree, but then they have a new crop of jack pine. So what you see is what you get for some species. So aspen, fire goes through and you get a whole bunch of suckers. So it's used to fire. It's used to fire. And I think a lot of our ecologies are also used to fire. Like it's not just the uh, uh, replacing the stands, right? We've got ungulates that depend on, you know, that's their grazing, that's their habitat. Um, all of those elements and then others like insect populations as well are you know contingent on birds flowers biodiversity everything yeah it's used to this kind of fire then new growth and you have pioneer species and then maturing and then another fire and different species use different aspects of this life cycle for the forest and when Europeans came over, the indigenous populations of North America and around the world 
have had a much more close relationship to working with fire, with working with Mother Nature as opposed to against it. So when Europeans came here, they saw fire as a competitor for wood, and they said, sure. "Well, we can put it out." Okay, and that <laughs> lasted for maybe a hundred years. And it still exists in some places to this day, but many agencies are now moving away from that model and saying, we will allow fire in the landscape when and where possible. Okay. So if a fire starts two kilometers from Grand Prairie, it takes a half second to say, this is an unwanted fire. You put it out. Okay. If a fire starts 200 kilometers north of Slave Lake, there's nothing there that's of societal value in terms of infrastructure or communities. And they can monitor that fire and decide what action to take and when to take it. So putting fire back on the landscape when and where possible. And in many parts of Canada, we are moving in that direction. Some areas though, you know, like you think of California, if a fire gets any size, it bumps into something and that's the real challenge and then you start have to using prescribed fire to bring fire back to the landscape or mechanical treatment to try and reduce the risk of these catastrophic fires that we're seeing more and more of and unfortunately the landscape is changing because of climate change and because there's more values on the landscape if you look at a map of canada you see more roads going north more development in the north so what used to be just bush, now there's communities, utility lines, pipelines, what have you. And so fire bumps into these things much more regularly than in the past. So what, what you're talking about, looking at all of those values, okay, and there are a number of different values. In Alberta, for example, we look at human life and community first and foremost, but other considerations you know, include the infrastructure, the ecology, the water systems, industry, such as oil and gas and forestry. So there are a lot of different things that go into making that decision. And I think when we were talking in email, one of the terms that came up a few times is risk-based assessment. So this is what we're starting to move to in Canada. So I guess I'm wondering why and how are we going to get there? Yeah, it's going to take time. So and I'll come from an emergency management perspective to start. Okay? So there's different phases in emergency management. Prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. Some people include review as well. So we need to know the risk across Canada for wildfire, as well as for floods and tsunamis, earthquakes, etc. But we're, we're talking fire today and we don't have it to this day we do not have a national uh, map of wildfire risk that's detailed enough to be of much value now communities and metro vancouver is a, is a great example they do have a detailed map of risk around their community but think of smaller communities they don't have the resources the money or the people to do that kind of emergency management plan so we need to do this across the country. The province and the feds have to help out getting this done. That's step one, okay? Because once you know the risk, then you can start taking actions to reduce the likelihood of catastrophic fire. And you're right. In terms of priorities, and this pretty well goes across Canada, first is human life, always. Second is communities and infrastructure. When you start getting down to priority three, it changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In Alberta, it's protecting critical watersheds, which is really important. But allowing fire back in the landscape, you know, I talk about unwanted fires, but there's also wanted fires. And you say, whoa, wanted fires? What do you mean? Well, think of mountain pine beetle, okay? Exactly. Fire is a great yeah. agent to knock that back. We have spruce budworm and east, same thing. Fire is great at knocking that back. So by having fire in the landscape, and sometimes because we have been suppressing fires, trees get old and decay, and we talk about old growth, but, you know, it's that life cycle again. If, you know, some species only live 100 years or 150 years, and then they just start falling. It looks hideous, okay? And <laughs> fire goes through, and you get a nice, you know, things get cleared up. Some of your listeners may mm -hmm. recall 1988, Yellowstone, a good chunk of Yellowstone burned down. 
And people that thought was it was a tragedy, okay? Notable but the parks, to their credit, use this as a learning opportunity and said, no, 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 this is not a tragedy, okay? Look at all the new wildflowers coming up. Look at the new seedlings coming up. This is just how Mother Nature works. And our park system in Canada, for a long time, has been using the same approach, trying to get fire back on the landscape, either through prescribed fire or allowing wildfires to do their job when and where possible. So the mountain pine beetle is a very good example of that. And you look at some of the catastrophic fires that came through BC after mountain pine beetle, right? And you had all of that dead wood. Whereas conversely, if we allowed some fire on the landscape, that good fire would help rejuvenate it and keep those insect populations under control. Is that correct? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of take home messages, big picture about fire, all right? The first is, there's a recipe for wildfire. It's a simple recipe. You need three things. Vegetation, fire people call it fuel, the stuff that burns. Ignition, people and lightning are the two common ones in Canada. It's about 50-50 in Canada most years. And the third is weather, hot, dry, windy weather. Typically, though, you can get by with dry and windy and you have a fire. Mm -hmm. And the other aspect that's really important is that extremes drive the fire world. I'll explain what I mean. Okay. In Canada, 3% of the fires burn, 97% of the area burned. So if you look at the distribution, it's that tail that wags the dog. And much of this happens, these catastrophic fires, and you think of Fort McMurray, you think of Slave Lake, you think of Chuck A Creek. Those are all Alberta examples since 2011. You know, just a few critical days of the hot, dry, windy weather those, the Slave Lake fire wasn't all that hot. It was around 20 or 21 Celsius, but it was extremely dry and windy. And Fort McMurray was the hot, dry, windy, as was Chuck A. Creek. Yes. So, so how is climate change and global heating contributing to those extremes? So there are, you'll find out fire people love threes. Okay, there's three reasons <laughs> why climate change is influencing our fire world here in Canada. The first is the warmer it is, the longer the fire seasons. We're talking October. It's almost the middle of October. And we've got active fires burning in British Columbia. Quite a few, actually. This is very unusual. Um, in Alberta, too, there are a few right now. There are some in the territories, which is even more unusual. Yes. because It's so far north. So our fire seasons are getting longer. Primarily in the spring. So the example I just quoted is this fall. But you know, in Alberta, the official fire season now starts March 1st. It used to be April 1st, but because seasons were starting and sometimes even actioning fires in February, we've moved it to March 1st. Okay. So longer fire seasons, more opportunities to burn. Second is the warmer it gets, the more lightning we see. And even though I said 50% of the fires are started by lightning, 50% started by people, it's the lightning caused fires that are increasing our area burn. Our area burn has doubled since the 70s, and this is due to human caused climate change and in particular lightning caused fires. Human caused fires number and area burn has been decreasing, but lightning has more than compensated for it. So longer fire seasons, more lightning, and the third is probably the most important, probably the most convoluted. All right? So as the atmosphere warms, the ability of it to suck moisture out of the fuel increases almost exponentially, not linearly, almost exponentially. So the hotter we get, the drier our fuels get, unless we see more precipitation. And what we're seeing and what the model suggests for the future is that the summers are going to be drier in much of our southern forests in Canada, including British Columbia and parts of Alberta. So there won't be any compensating effect from precipitation. So higher temperatures lead to drier fuels. And drier fuels are a critical aspect of our fire behavior. So drier fuels means it's easier to fire to start, whether it's an abandoned campfire or a lightning strike. It means it's easier to fire fire to spread. And it means more fuel, because it's dried out, is available to burn which leads to higher intensity fires, which are difficult to impossible to put out. Now, there's a public misconception, and 
it's sometimes the media plays a role because they have a picture of a plane dropping retardant or water on a fire and say, hey, I'm putting the fire out. If it's a big fire, it's not putting the fire out. It may be buying you time in the best case scenario, or it may be doing nothing except for wasting dollars. Okay? It's like spitting on a campfire and not doing anything. If it's fire small, that's initial attack, you can manage a fire, hit it hard, hit it fast, that's fine. But once the fire is big, like a Fort McMurray fire, you're not doing anything to it. A lot of people don't understand that. The direct attack at the high intensity of the fire, which we call the head, if it's engaging the crowns, and if you've seen video from the Fort McMurray fire, you see these towering flames, and we're not doing anything. It just continues going. It, in it's the- a freight train but moving along, okay? And you got to get out of the way, it. thus we evacuate, okay? But they do have a tool to fight fires like this. And that's where it's called a back burner. And you get out in front of the wildfire and you light a new fire, but it's fighting against the wind. It's not going with the wind. And then it burns towards the wildfire. They meet and the wildfire then has no fuel to burn. It can be very effective as long as the wind shift doesn't happen. As long as the winds stay the same, we're okay. It gets very challenging in mountains because the yeah you know, the winds, valleys, and slopes, and yeah, it gets tricky. But that is an indirect attack tool that's very effective. Yeah, so we've got a lot of ways of using fire, not only to fight fire, but the ecological benefits and a lot of different ways. How difficult do you think it's going to be to change management strategy? you know, to shift that paradigm and not only with the public that might perceive fire as, you know, this big, bad, evil monster, but also internally, like operationally. So we're already moving in that direction. Changes are happening. And one of the best examples is Ontario. Uh, They use something called appropriate response. And so when a fire is detected, they do an assessment. And this has to be done within five minutes. All right because it's a critical situation. So a fire starts, and if it's two kilometers from Dryden, it takes half a second to say that's unwanted fire. You try and put it out while it's small because it's too close to a community. If it's 200 kilometers north of Dryden, then they get a weather forecast for the next 14 days. They get run a fire growth model for the next 14 days to say, where is that fire going to spread if we don't put it out? And then they make a decision whether it's beneficial or not. And beneficial, i.e. getting rid of spruce budworm or have old diseased or decayed stands that need renewing. So they make that decision within five minutes. And then if it's to monitor that fire, then they will check the next day to see the new fire weather forecast, new fire growth model to say, has anything changed? And sometimes you'll say, okay, we'll let it burn to this lake but we won't let it get any farther than that because there's something of value on the other side of the lake. Well, we'll stop it there. And this gets to a position, what we call modified response. So it's starting to get more complicated, but it's, it's a much better approach. And I'll use BC as an example for a modified response. Okay, so typically you put it out, an initial attack, hit hard, hit fast, get it out. Or there was kind of, we'll watch it, okay? But there's also now a modified, okay, and there was a, another fire near Lytton this year. And near the structures and the community, they fought it hard, okay? But then it spread up the slope, up the mountains. And where it was actually beneficial for the fire, they say, okay, we're going to let that burn for now. We're going to monitor it. We'll fight it down the valley, but leave it in the upper slopes to do what Mother Nature wants to do. So it's very nuanced, but it's very appropriate. And that's called a modified response. So it's the like when you get asked a question and the answer is, it depends. It depends on the situation and the context for that specific fire at that specific location at this specific time. And that's the way we should be doing it. And that's the way we're starting to do it. But even if we do everything right, you can go from a spark or a lightning strike to a raging inferno in 15 to 20 minutes. And if the conditions are right. If it's hot, dry, windy, the fuels are dry, the fuels are conifers, you have a very narrow window. And sometimes just where the resources are and the location of the fire, you can't get to it in time, unfortunately. 
And and that's exactly what we saw happen, like you mentioned in uh, Lytton, in Slave Lake, yeah. in Fort McMurray, or Hearst River Fire, which, you know, I mean, these are expensive fires. We're yeah, so Fort McMurray is the costliest disaster in Canadian history. Some of the water people will try and tell you it was Calgary flood, but no, that's the Fort McMurray fire. Whether you talk insured losses or uninsured losses, insured losses are close to just under $4 billion. Uninsured losses are closer to $10 billion. But that pales to some of the California stories where we're talking multiple tens of billions. In Canada, we spend on average about $1 billion a year fighting fires. And it's been going up and up and it will continue to go up and up. So, you know, as we change our strategies, maybe we can start getting a handle on that. As we allow more fire on the landscape, the cost should go down, okay? And as we use employ more technology, hopefully the costs go down. But the most effective tool at putting a fire out are ground crews, okay? Boots on the ground. They're the most effective in terms of getting it out and in terms of cost. And many people haven't quite recognized that, but that's the truth is ground crews do the work. Oh, yeah, they're an important part of our response during fire season. Critical, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and you mentioned something about fire on the landscape, and a term that I keep coming across is that we as a society now need to learn to live with wildfire on the landscape. So we can't eliminate it. It's part of the natural system, so we have to learn to live with fire and smoke. That doesn't mean that you know we say, oh, we're going to lose communities. We can do lots of things to reduce the risk, but we cannot eliminate the risk. That's the direct impact of smoke. The more indirect is smoke. And the thing about smoke is you can be downtown Vancouver or downtown Toronto and say, hey, my place isn't going to burn down. And they're right. Their place isn't going to burn down from a wildfire. It may burn down for other reasons, but not from a wildfire. But they can be smoked out for weeks. Air quality can be in the tank. And people don't realize is the more we know about smoke, the more we find out how bad it is for your health. Okay, But there are things we can do, uh, limit strenuous activities, close your windows. But if it's a prolonged period, the air quality inside your house will be as bad as outside, unless you have air purifiers. And I live in a smoky place and air purifiers are good for everything. And I have lots of these things. They're little, horrible, <laughs> they work. So if you are in a smoky environment, yeah, air purifier. It's also air purifier. Glass pollen and all sorts of things. And they're not that expensive. Air quality is a critical aspect. And there's a third aspect to fire, and that's a cascading effect. And we saw that in British Columbia in 2021. So there were lots of fires in British Columbia in 2021. Then we had an event called an atmospheric river, yeah. which is just a band of precipitation that just keeps on coming and coming and coming. And we had mudslides and flooding and the Coquihalla Highway was washed out in many places. And many of those places were where there was a recent burn. Yeah. And I'm not saying the burn caused the flooding, but it makes it more likely to flood in those places. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Because after a fire, it's killed the vegetation. So there's no canopy to intercept the precipitation, no active root system to suck it up. And some ash from fires were called hydrophobic, which means it repels water. So it's almost like having concrete. So heavy rain comes and just flows down the hill and mud flows, debris flows are much more likely in a recently burned area than a, a non-burned area. So these are impacts from fire and we have continued to see impacts and we have to learn to live with these impacts and we have to be prepared. So, you know, this is part of climate change adaptation there's kind of two worlds here. There's disaster risk reduction. So when they build a highway, they say, oh, what was the climate in the past? And we have to prepare for a one in 100 year flood. Okay, climate change adaptation says looks forward and say, what used to be a one in 100 year flood is now one every five years or every 10 years. So you have to build for what we expect in the future, not what we saw in the past. And they've been two silos. Hopefully they'll start to work together so that our highways, when we get these burns and then these atmospheric rivers, we didn't have umpteen bridges washed away. Okay. It's easy for me to say in hindsight, because you know, these roads were built a while ago, but moving forward, when we rebuild, 
we have to build back better. We have to be prepared for not just what's happened yesterday and today, but what's going to happen later this century if it's something that is going to be around for decades, like highways and utility lines, etc. We have to harden the system, they call it. Be prepared to handle whatever comes our way. Yeah, being prepared for the future. There's another element to that that you are very involved in. And I'm just looking at the Canadian Wildfire Strategic Network. And there's a huge, huge effort there to see students and people trained in science related to wildfire. Why is that so important? So for many years, the amount of fire research going on was not a lot, okay? Not a lot of funding. So this funding came from NSERC, Natural Science and Engineering Research Council. And it's about $5 million and it's spread all across the country a number of universities. And so far we've had 70 graduate students involved in fire research from permafrost and budworm to using, you know, LIDAR, remote sensing, looking at weather. Some of it's very applied to help fire management agencies, you know, deal with fire we're seeing today and what the fire we're seeing tomorrow. There was an excellent article in McLean's a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, I've been fighting fires for 30 years. And if you don't believe in climate change, come talk to me because today's fires are so much different than what I started with. And so fires are becoming at times more intense and challenging. And we need to be better prepared. We need better tools to make informed decisions, not just to put the fires out like we talked about, but knowing when to put the fires out and when not to put the fires out is a key way forward. And so we're looking at lightning, we're looking at fire weather forecasting. So we're training the next generation of researchers and operational people as well. Some of these people will, will work for fire management agencies. So, you know, it's been a long time coming, but it's great to see. And I expect more in the coming because the risks, the challenges are only going to increase. So we need more investment in fire. And so, you know, a couple of things, we can prevent fires, okay? So 50% of the fires are human caused. Every one of those is preventable. Second is people can play a key role in detecting fires. Uh, cell phone coverage is increasing. And most places now, the public is the number one source of fire detection. And places like BC has an app where you can actually take pictures, give geographical information, you can pin it, as well as you know, detecting, hey, I see a fire you know, at 10 a.m., five kilometers north of Merritt, BC, okay? Here's a picture, <laughs> you know? And that, that's very useful information. It's kind of crowdsourcing and something we should be doing more of. Right on. Thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate you joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. It's called a risk-appropriate response. Wildfire management agencies in Canada are increasingly considering human life and community ecosystems, and economically driven elements when making strategic decisions that determine how resources will be deployed to a fire. Hello, Cordy. Good afternoon. So as our climate changes and the earth warms, we've seen more wildfire on the landscape, more extreme wildfires, a longer wildfire season, and increasing frequency and severity of wildfires. So do we need to learn to live with more wildfire? Um, and how can shifting the management priorities accommodate that? Well, that's a big question, Michelle. It is. <laughs> I know. There's a lot in there. there. There is a lot in there. Yeah, so for sure, uh, climate change is, is changing the uh, wildfire activity across Canada, uh, around the world. And uh, we're finding that fire is going places that it has never gone to before. Um, it's quite amazing. I mean, May is the April now, as you uh, indicated, the wildfire seasons are getting longer. There's some evidence showing that we're going to be getting more lightning as, as well 
What's interesting, though, is the number of fires globally and the number of fires in Canada, the actual number of fires are not increasing. Uh, you can pick some regions and look at just specific regions and time periods and show that there's been some increase. But what's really increasing is the number of evacuations and the number of disasters. So we're, we're seeing more interactions between wildfire and values or assets. Mm -hmm. And that's in part because we are getting more extreme wildfire behavior. And there are a lot of anecdotes from wildland firefighters indicating they've just, they've never seen this, this extreme fire behavior before. So, you know, hotter, bigger, faster, we're, we're getting more of these, these really intense fires and they're running into communities. They're running into infrastructure and that's causing problems. So yes, um, something has to change. Um, and the climate is changing and it's changing quickly. And particularly in the north, we're seeing a, a warming considerably two times as fast <clears throat> as elsewhere. So yeah, there is definitely a need, I would call it the big rethink. Um, we need to learn to live with fire because fire is not going away. And a lot of people talk about these really bad fire seasons that we're getting and uh, referring to that as, well, this is the new norm. And, and myself and others uh, like, like Dr. Mike Flanagan were saying, no, this, this is not the new norm. It's gonna continue to get worse. It's, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. So there's a real need that we have to uh, look at how we can better live with wildland fire. And both embracing um, its positive values and then also its negative values. And so that's uh, an area that I'm really interested in is looking at how, yeah, okay, how can we go about then living with fire on the landscape? Right. So in your paper, you refer to a double paradox. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So can you maybe explain that a little bit? Well, I started um, really an interest in fire in 19, I think it would have been around 1982. There was a mountain pine beetle infestation, 1977 to about 1982. And um, I moved from Ontario to Waterton Park, uh, working for Parks Canada. And that was quite interesting, this mountain pine beetle, because it really hit home to me that the reason there was a mountain pine beetle outbreak was because, you know, the park had suppressed fire successfully for, for quite a few years. And then what happens is you just end up with this contiguous uh, fuels on, on the landscape. There's no mosaic. There's no mixture of young, old, medium age, mm -hmm. small patches, medium patches, big patches. So the mountain pine beetle... And that was kind of interesting because that was kind of a warning that, look, you keep putting fire out, it's going to come back to bite you because the, the fuels are building and building and building. And then when the fire does happen, it becomes a conflagration. It becomes really very difficult to, to contain. So the paradox is that if you keep putting fire out, um, you're making that situation worse. So... I really saw in Waterton Lakes National Park with this mountain pine beetle outbreak that, yeah, there is, there is a role for fire to, to break up that landscape, to create a younger stands, a, a more vibrant, healthier landscape. And not that long ago, there was the uh, Kenal Fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Kenal Fire burned uh, two-thirds of, uh, of the park. So the other paradox is that one way that we could learn to live with fire is to actually use fire as well. So being able to apply fire on the landscape. So paradoxically, we need to use fire to put what we would say more black on the landscape. So there are opportunities for wildfire management agencies, particularly when the conditions are not severe weather-wise, where fire can be allowed to play its more natural role on the landscape. And by doing that, you, you create more of a mosaic and a healthier landscape that is able to buffer or be more resilient. So the, you know, the word that we use now is we need communities that are more resilient, landscapes that are more resilient, and not just resilient to fire, but healthy landscapes, healthy communities, you could argue, are more resilient, not just to fire, but to floods and, and, and other disasters uh, as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it is an interesting paradox. You keep putting fire out, it's going to come back and get you with big unwanted fires. 
And then paradoxically, we're going to need fire down that road to help us because it, it's just not physically possible to do fuel management on the entire boreal forest, for example, or, or in the entire province. It's going to take too long and it's just too difficult. And it's not really something that I think would be even, you know, governments would have a social license to try to do that. So, yeah, it's a very interesting. So I think part of the solution to living with fire is to embracing fire. And much like the same way that the uh, First Nations people did, they, they embraced mm -hmm. fire. Fire was in their toolkit. Uh, they, they used fire and they understood both its negative and its positive effects. Yes. Now, mountain pine beetle, recently we saw a pretty devastating outbreak of mountain pine beetle in British Columbia and Alberta. And there was some concern at the time that there was a threat. It was going to continue right through the boreal forest eastward, which it didn't. That's a good thing. But are any of the extreme fires that we've seen since in British Columbia related to that? If we were managing the wildfire on the landscape better, do you think, you know, we could have prevented some of those fires? Because that did create a lot of fuel. Yeah, I think it was in 2003, we had the Kelowna wildfire. Mm -hmm. And I believe it started in a park. And there was a proposal to do a prescribed burn uh, mm -hmm. in that park. Uh, this was before the, uh, the, the fire. But Kelowna City Council was vehemently against having a prescribed fire, uh, concerns about smoke. And so they squashed that prescribed burn. So yeah, clearly, I mean, would the mountain pine beetle have still uh, that epidemic happened? Probably, but would it have had the same impact? Maybe not if we had managed the fuels a little bit more. So mm -hmm. I, I, again, it's all about the age class. You want to have a landscape, like I say, with, with young, and old, but not all old. And you don't want to have contiguous stands where if a fire started mm -hmm. to burn, there's nothing to stop it. It's just this constant ocean of, of, of fuel. Mm -hmm. So I think fuel management, and I, I can say that with some confidence now, because now fuel management in the BC Wildfire Service is you know one of their first priorities. So you're starting to see, the, and in fact, the three governors in the west coast of the United States, uh, Washington, Oregon, California, they got together with the premier of BC and, and they signed the Memorandum of Understanding. And it's just referred to as the Coastal Government Coalition. And they got together and they realized that they have to start working together on climate change. And one of the things was is talking about building resilient uh, communities mm -hmm. and resilient landscapes and uh, working together to be able to do more fuel management. So, yeah, there certainly could have been fewer evacuations. You know, if mm -hmm. we had protected the communities ahead of time, done more fuel management around these communities, absolutely, there, there would have been much fewer evacuations. More could have been done. In terms of the mountain pine beetles, certainly more could have been done. Uh, hard to say whether it would have stopped the infestation, but I think it wouldn't have been perhaps as extreme. Well, a, he a healthier forest, those trees wouldn't have been as susceptible to the beetle, right? Yeah, exactly. So you want to have some youth. You want to have some a, a landscape that's just made up of you know an old age class and what we also refer to as an even age class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you want you don't want to have that. That's not a healthy forest. No, and you want some mix as well. Like the boreal forest is a mix of coniferous and deciduous trees and grasses and there you know it's it's a whole mixture that that it's important to have that exactly. So yeah, quite a bit more could have been done to have mitigated for sure. Mm -hmm. So the biannual Canada Wildfire Conference is being held in Edmonton in two weeks. You're one of the speakers. You are speaking on wildland fire science ecosystem in Canada, how the past has shaped current interrelationships and opportunities to address a future with more wildfire. So I guess, do we need wildfire? And how has a history of exclusion impacted the current and future fire regimes in Canada? So the talk that I'm giving at the conference, I'm, I'm really looking at key events in the past mm -hmm. that, that have influenced uh, relationships, and in particular relationships with regard to building fire science capacity and capability in Canada. So the presentation I gave was really looking at what were some of the drivers 
uh, historically of fostering communication and uh, coordination, collaboration, cooperation, the, the, the four C's. So there were some really critical events in Canada uh, starting in 1889 even when the Dominion Forest Service uh, set up, kind of modeling after the U.S. Forest Service. And what's interesting is they needed to manage the uh, Dominion lands. And a lot of the Dominion lands were actually in Alberta along the east slopes, the, uh, the forest reserves. And so there was a real focus on protecting these forests along the east slopes, mainly to conserve the water yield for the prairie provinces. And then there was also a big desire or um, objective to plant trees, to continue to plant trees, particularly in, in the prairies. So my talk, I identify these, these key events on, on a timeline, but the real big event that happened in Canada that influenced the fire science and fire science ecosystem was in um, 1995. The government decided uh, there was really, really good cooperation in the 1980s as a result of these forest resource development agreements. And these development agreements included projects and work related to wildfire management identified by each agency, what research they required. And then in 1995, the, uh, the government of the day decided that they were going to stop these forest resource development agreements. So these were agreements between the federal government and then the provincial agencies and the territorial governments. And that was a really a big deal because all of a sudden there was a reduction of 66% in staff. So the fire research community was really impacted in, in that regard. And then the flagship, the Petawawa, the National Forest Experiment Station, um, was shut down in 1996. So Canada's had a really um, a roller coaster, very politically driven wildfire science research program. So there are five forestry centers in Canada, and they were delivering services to their clients, to the provinces and agencies. But then, as a result of this 1995 review, the government decided, well, we're going to change, and we want to become a smaller, more strategic research targeted organization. And so that just meant that they were looking, instead of providing regional services, national services. And so that really turned over the whole way in terms of how research was being done and uh, how federal agencies interact with provincial agencies and how do you get this cooperation, coordination, and collaboration mm -hmm. uh, going. So I was really interested in my presentation that I'll be given, I give six examples where the four C's really came yeah. out to, to shine. So I'm really interested in when in Canada did the four C's really work and then why did they work really, really well? Because uh, I'm quite passionate about building strong collaborative initiatives uh, across Canada because I think getting back to your first question about how are we going to be able to live with fire, mm -hmm. well, we're going to have to work together on this. Yeah. I mean, everybody on the landscape is going to have to pull together, and that, that's why we need good communication. We need good cooperation, coordination, and collaboration mm -hmm. because there are different players on the landscape. You've got an industrial footprint on the landscape. You've got communities on the landscape. You've got parks on the landscape. You've got all these competing values. Mm -hmm. So in order to live with fire, it's a big landscape. There are a lot of players. They, they all need to come together and, and agree to this common objective of, how can we make our community resilient? Mm -hmm. So I give a number of examples. A really good example I'd like to give is um, the uh, Canada Wildfire. So Canada Wildfire is an organization that was uh, set up, and they have a management team. And so members of Canada Wildfire discuss what projects they want to work on together. Mm -hmm. And so they can do leverage funding. They can work on projects together. It's just been a really, really good example of where Saskatchewan Alberta, British Columbia, Parks Canada, the Northwest Territories, University of Alberta, mm -hmm. are all working together towards a common strategic objectives. And it's working out really, really, really well. So that, again, no one agency can go with this alone, whether it's the federal government or a provincial agency. And so that's the real struggle is, how do you get agencies to work together laterally across Canada? Mm -hmm. And how do you get the federal government to work with these agencies? And, and then on top of that, First Nations people and the public. Yeah, it sounds like the Canada Wildfire has been very successful at demonstrating how that could be done. Yeah, it has. Now we need to move that into more of the operations and yes, yes, mitigation. Right. So the 
first conference was in 2010, uh, held in uh, Ontario, and the intent of the conference actually was is to bridge wildfire operations people with researchers. So it was a, a forum, and the forum really focused on discussions, identifying uh, needs and issues, and bringing these two sort of camps together. But the focus was on operations. Mm-hmm. So what, what are the needs of the wildfire management operations? What are the issues and what are the opportunities to work on some projects together? The conference that's coming up that starts the end of the month, it, it is much wider now. So we're, we've kind of lost that forum where the wildfire management operations folks can talk to the researchers. The Wildland Fire Canada conference is, is now a, a much more inclusive, a bigger conference that, that covers a broader spectrum of topics that that's covering. So yeah, but Canada Wildfire has been a really, really a good example. Another example that I give is uh, one of the staff at the Alberta Forest Service, uh, Terry Van Est, spent six months at the Northern Forestry Center working with the fire management team there. Oh, okay. And that was really remarkable. The one up in uh, NWT? Uh, no, this the the Northern Forestry Center right here in Edmonton. Oh, here. So okay. it's one of the five forestry centers across Canada. And so there is a forestry center in Victoria, and, and they service BC and the Yukon. Edmonton services Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and the territories. And there's another... Re- Forestry Centre in Sault Ste. Marie, Services Ontario, there's another one in Quebec, and then there's an Atlantic Forestry one. Let's um, maybe get back to uh, the kind of the ecology. Um, Do we need wildfire? Oh, absolutely. Fire belongs in the boreal forest. When you think about it, you know, these plants and animals that, that have coexisted and been living with fire for thousands of years, perhaps 10,000 years or more. And so they've lived with this constant evolutionary pressure uh, of fire. And the same thing is now happening to us. But these plants and animals, over many, many, many years, this constant evolutionary pressure of fire, they end up developing characteristics that allow them to survive with fire, which is quite interesting. So in the boreal forest, you have Ceanothus plant that the seeds can stay buried in the soil for 80 years. And they just stay there, these seeds buried, waiting for heat. And then the heat actually opens or heat activates yes. these uh, the seeds and they sprout. You get these remarkable um, traits that uh, over time have been selected because of this constant evolutionary force of fire. And so it's really quite amazing. So yeah, fire belongs. Can you imagine removing rain from the tropical forest? Mm-hmm. Same thing, you removed fire from fire-dependent ecosystems. Well, and that's what we've done. That's what we've done, yeah. yeah. But we're fortunate, Michelle, in that we are getting a lot of fire by default, whether we like it or not. But there's a lot of places where we should be getting more fire, no question about that. So we are getting quite a bit of fire by default. I think the big challenge that we're going to have right now is we're getting too much fire, so... Yeah. And we're outside the range of natural variability in terms of the effects that we're going to get. So we almost need to identify what is the limit of fire on the landscape before that landscape is not resilient enough to take that fire. So, so uh, as an example of that, I was reading about western coniferous forests because they haven't been burned in so long. You've got just fuels that are so ready for wildfire that they're actually changing the composition of the soil when they do burn. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, so just a, a, you know, a good example of why we need to, uh, you know, let Mother Nature do her thing sometimes. Yeah, so we have kind of two different types of maybe three fire regimes where we have like in the interior BC that mm-hmm. Ponderosa Pine dug fir, where there was this periodicity of fire the low to moderate intensity fires. In the boreal forest, it's more the high intensity fires. So the forest in BC, if you keep putting these low to moderate intensity fires, we get what we call as a vertical fuel buildup. You get a structure of fuel that starts up in the ground and goes right to the crown. Right. So you need these low to moderate intensity fires to manage that fuel load to prevent the fire from getting into the crown. So you can have these very, very, very large trees that should be surviving the fires, and, and they're not because the fire now has this amazing thick 
vertical field continuity. And in the boreal forest, it's less the vertical field continuity, it's more the horizontal mosaic and patches across the landscape. Less the vertical, but more the, more the horizontal. And then some landscapes, we get what's called a mixed fire regime. But you're right, we're going to get effects from these extreme fires that we're, we're still learning from. Yeah, and the plants and the animals, they, um, I mean, these trees can survive for, for many, many, many years. To adapt is going to take a very, very, very long, long, long time as well. But right now we're getting too much fire, too intense fire. We're getting the impacts that are outside, as you say, the, mm -hmm. the natural range of variability. Yeah, And they don't have time to adapt. They don't have time to adapt. That's yeah. exactly right. They can't put on their running shoes and run away, Yeah, these trees. So it's really interesting. Yeah, so we are starting to see more in the north, more aspen regrowth, drier. We are seeing, as you suggested, uh, species composition changes, soil changes. Mm -hmm. And we're getting fires in the tundra that we've never seen before. And, and some suggestions that the boreal forest is actually moving further north. Yeah, you can see that for sure. Uh, the warmer climates, you're going to see more opportunity for uh, seedling establishment, and there will be a movement of the forest north. I think that about covers it. Is there anything else, Cordy, that you'd like to say? No, other than, you know, fire is such a unique phenomena. I mean, when you really think about it, of all the disasters, we've been able to tame fire. And that's what I find really interesting because that gives us the opportunity to use fire. We don't fight hurricanes. We don't fight tornadoes. We don't fight earthquakes. We fight fire with fire. We don't fight hurricanes with fire. And as I say, we've been able to tame and use fire campfires. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the First Nations people had a long list of uses for fire. We don't use hurricanes. We don't use floods. We don't use tornadoes. So fire is such an interesting phenomena because, you know, we're all exposed to fire in some way, shape, or form. And that's why it's been suggested by Steve Pine that there is this new era called the Pyrocene. Right. Yeah. And Steve Pine is kind of like the father of wildfire in North America, right? He's written right. a lot of, uh, he's written a lot about wildfire. Yeah, and that, well, not just in North America, but the world. So yeah, he is considered the world expert on fire history. Yeah, so he takes a very interesting perspective on fire and uh, how it's really shaped our mm -hmm. culture and, and our thinking. Sorry, I interrupted you. Can you tell us what the pyrocene is? Well, the pyrocene is just an era like the Anthropogenic scene or, or these different periods. So the um, Anthropocene is the, the Pyrocene is one that he's suggesting will be the next big period that explains what's happening and shaping. So I don't know all of the names of these periods, but there's <laughs> the glacial period and all, all these different periods. Yeah. And he's just suggesting that fire has had such a prominence globally in, in terms of shaping everything from smelting, you mm -hmm. know, to our little campfires. Fire is in some way, shape, or form everywhere in what we do. We drive our car. That's fire. That's mm -hmm. combustion. Heat. Heat. Cooking. Exactly. Everything. E everything. So he kind of takes fire and looks at it through this lens of that, you know, fire is everywhere. And now we're just seeing this amazing new activity. Of, so he is suggesting that there is this new epoch. They're called epochs or, or era. And the Pyrocene is perhaps what could very well be the name of where we are now and could be continuing for a while. Hmm. That is very interesting. Yeah. How do we change the paradigm from people thinking all fire is bad because this is what we're used to? How do we change the operational paradigm from all fire is bad, we've got to go put it all out? Um, that's going to be, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be a, a real... It's a challenge, isn't it? It's going to be a real challenge for sure because you have to change culture. You have to change how people think. And people think through experience or act through experience. But if you want to be proactive, you want to have people understand that they need to do things, you know, now, right? And that's why the Fire Smart and Fire Smart Canada has been a really successful program. And that is a program that basically helps homeowners learn how to mitigate the potential for fire around their properties. Exactly. So how do we make this paradigm shift? For wildfire management agencies, I've suggested the paradigm shift triangle where there are three components where agencies have to increase their suppression capacity and capability, uh, number one, because there's just going to be more extreme wildfire activity. The second one is, as we discussed earlier, is this idea of putting more black on the landscape, mm -hmm. putting more managed fire on the landscape. Yeah. Well, in order to do that, you have to have a strong suppression capacity and capability. Mm -hmm. 
And then the third one is harden your values. Identify what you value on that landscape and harden it. That is fire smart it ahead of time, protect it. And so what happens is the wildfire management agencies are starting to become structural or asset protection agencies and they're not really doing their original job. So, for example, the Fort McMurray wildfire in 2016. Mm -hmm. Also the costliest disaster in Canadian history. Exactly, yeah. So the tanker had to be pulled from the fire because there was a small fire within the community. So if you could harden and protect your assets, your values at risk ahead of time, you're much better off. So it's understanding then what values are vulnerable. And it's not just the asset, but it's also the people when you think about it. Mm -hmm. If you have a community that is largely a retirement community, well, they have special needs and issues that need to be addressed up front. Mm -hmm. You know, access roads, one road in, one road out. Do you have two roads out? Power. Power, yeah. We're seeing that on the East Coast right now as they're recovering from a hurricane. Oh, exactly. Exactly, a yeah. A lot of seniors' facilities were left without power yeah, for yeah. extended lengths of time. Yeah, yeah, good point. So I think it's going to take time. It's a culture shift in the agencies. It's a culture shift in communities. But we need to build the leaders you know, within the communities. We need to fund these initiatives. It's going to take time. And, and, of course, governments have so many priorities and issues that they're juggling in the air. But as we indicated in the, our one paper that we published, fire's not going away. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not the new norm. We're going to get more fire. It's going to be more intense, bigger, hotter, faster. So we have to start to change how we're doing things. And yeah, we have to learn to live with fire. And I think that will happen, but it's going to take some time. And hopefully not too many communities like Lytton. We will need to experience that too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. It was <laughs> great to chat. You've been listening to episode one of Fire on the Landscape, an Earth Common Journal podcast production. Tune in again as we examine the challenges and complexities of adapting wildfire management on an earth becoming increasingly prone to extreme wildland fire events. Producer and host of Fire on the Landscape is Michelle Hewley. Technical production and editor is Alfonso Acevedo. Music composition is by Mercy Joshua.